to read a short verse from the Bible. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 to 16 says, All this for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Good morning, everybody. It's a joy to be here today, and I thank the Lord for the worship team as they remind us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I'm into that, and it's joyful to see that strength being demonstrated so beautifully this morning. What a beautiful morning. Bright, sun, clear, after the storms we had yesterday. So fresh, you just want to stay outside. Quite a contrast to yesterday. I remember a few days ago watching the weather forecast, and the forecaster was saying, there's, you know, the expression to use are really neat. He says, there's deep gulf moisture moving in from the south, and there is a Pacific storm coming from the north, and that corresponds to an upper level disturbance, and they're all going to meet together over Houston, and oh, by the way, and he says it will almost glee in his eyes, there's going to be twist in the atmosphere, so there's big chances you're going to get tornadoes. And they got so concerned about this combination of things that they even brought up the uh, UH football game yesterday. 
um, a bit earlier, so to avoid all that very nasty weather that was coming. And then they started backtracking. And they said, well, you know, the, the red zone where you're going to get the most thunderstorms and so on is actually going to be just missing us. We're still going to get the rain, watch out, but they started backpedaling on their predictions. And as it turned out, they were pretty good. You know, and the, the storms came in just after the game. The boys got in home just before the real heavy rain started. But definitely no severe thunderstorms, definitely no tornadoes. Thank the Lord for that. And so these guys do their best to predict things, and they try to be on the safe side so that we don't blame them. But there are still limits to what they can do. And I'd like to, this morning, read through a different kind of prediction, a different kind of warning that was given to us 2,000 years ago, not three days ago, 2,000 years ago. And since it comes from a higher authority, I would put in even more credence to it than uh, the weather forecast, even though it got it almost right. And the reading is going to be from Luke 21. I'll be reading 5 to 7 and then 29 to 36. So starting with verse 5, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? And Jesus uh, spends uh, quite a while telling them in detail about what's going on, but I'd like to, since this is only a five-minute uh, sermon, I'd like to start with verse 29 to explain to, the stu to their students, the disciples, he told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth, be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So the Lord's prediction is for time forevermore, not for four days down the road. It's not for the Houston area. It's for the whole world. And it's for each and every one of us. And I'd like to read again verse 34. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Now, as Christians, you say, just a second, I'm not going to be dissipated in all the bad things, and I haven't touched a beer in two days, two weeks, whichever. But how about the anxieties of life? That is one thing that's guaranteed going to happen more than once for each and every one of us. And the Lord is saying to us, guard not your wallet or your 401k retirement account or whatever it is that year, guard your heart. So the prediction for us is that we will see those anxieties, we will see those challenges, we will see those persecutions, and... What we can do about it is rather than coming early from a football game is guard our heart. Pray to the Lord. Lord, I know that I'm listening to your will. I know I'm following up. What is it that you from above see that I'm not leaving guarded properly? Tell me about it, that I may also guard it, and I may be ready to face you with a clean conscience and a pure heart when the time comes. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Lord, I thank you for the anticipation of being here.
to hear your word, Lord, and to being blessed by your presence. Lord, I ask and I pray that you will give us your wisdom, give us your spirit, that we may see through your eyes what is it that we have to watch out specifically for each and every one of us, that we may, Lord, face the times that are coming with assurance, with the joy of you being our strength, that we may ultimately face you with a clear conscience and the joy that comes with knowing, Lord, that we have fulfilled what you have in mind for us. Lord, I thank you for this gathering, and I pray for your blessings on each and every one of our people here. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. trust in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It li its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So I think this verse is just calling us to put our strength and our trust in the Lord rather than on ourselves. Um, and I, put, I ask that you sing along with our next song, Lord, I Need You.
This is such a blessed morning, and I want to tell you that the Lord has uh, challenged my heart over the last few days with a, um, with a story in the Bible that is very familiar to all of us. It's the story of David and Goliath. And although I've read it so many times and heard, uh, you know, meditated on it many times, but it sort of spoke to my heart in a, in a new way. But I just want to make some disclaimers this morning, and I want to make sure that you realize them. This is a fight, as you well know, between two representatives uh, of, of two people. Uh, but it has its spiritual meaning, and unless you understand it spiritually, you can get lost in the details. The people of God, represented by David, and David is representing the son of David, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the enemy, basically, uh, represented by this big giant who is Goliath, a real giant. And he's representing Satan, the giant who can really intimidate you and bully you and frighten you. The reality is that even genealogically and historically, the one group which is on the other side is referred to as the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were Christian, that is from Crete, a group of people that are now extinct and have no relationship genealogically in any form or fashion to the current Palestinians. I just want you to make sure you know this. The Israelites on the other side represent the people of God in the Old Testament, and they, many of them who believed in Jesus Christ continued to be the people of God in the New Testament, and many of the people here who are Middle Eastern Christians are from that background. So this is genealogically, but spiritually, this represents the Israel of God, which is the church today, which are the people, that is the people of God, who have been washed by the blood of Christ, the son of David, and have been filled with his spirit, or born of his spirit. So this morning, bear with me, I want uh, my dear brother Joshua to uh, read the passage, and, and if you can just kind of... Uh, Think about that part. I'm reading the last passage. Now, you remember, the giant is standing there and shouting for 40 days and intimidating the people of God, and his name is Goliath. And this little boy, shepherd boy, who is a, possibly was a teenager, uh, wants to step in and go for the fight. And go ahead, Brother Josh. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Palestine, uh, Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David, David with his armor, and he put the bronze helmet on his head. So he clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk it with these, for I... <clears throat> Excuse me, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag, 
and a pouch which he put, uh, which, I'm sorry, a patch which he had, and he his sling uh, was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore uh, the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, uh, ruddy and good-looking. So <clears throat> the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by, uh, by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air, and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of all ar of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you unto my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the uh, camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is, uh, there is a God in Israel. Then this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into, uh, he will give you into our hands. So it was with the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead, so that his stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no uh, sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of his sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistine saw that their champion was dead, they fled. So let me give you an idea of uh, the size of this giant and how, how uh, terrifying he is. He is nine feet, nine inches tall nine feet, nine inches tall. I mean, can, can you imagine what a, what a giant he is? I mean, he's almost uh, uh, three meters, for those who want to translate, and uh, three meters and, and maybe 20 cents, uh, 20 uh, centimeters. Uh, incredibly huge. Uh, his size, the way he sort of measures it, I mean, his color was, was probably around 40. Uh, his, his belt... Uh, would, would, would have a kind of a, the, the range of, a, uh, of around 60 or 65. And, and he, on top of all of this, was with all this big size, I mean, this guy is, can you imagine how tall he is and how wide he is? He's, he's the kind of a dream of the, of the best NBA uh, coach, if you may. And, and with this kind of big size, on top of all of this, he has, if you measure them, but, you know, translate sort of the, he would have 175 pounds of armor on him, his helmet, his breastplate on him, his, his shield, his sword was probably three times as big as David's size. I mean, the, the, the person is just incredibly huge, a giant. And this giant stood out and they kind of made a deal that they would do representative battle. Instead of avoid excessive bloodshed, one person would come from this side and one person from, comes from that side. Now, the giant from the side of the Philistines uh, the, was, was this man, and he's from the land of Gath. And he had four other, four other brothers with him who was probably were as big. I mean, they're all genealogically the kind of the same size. The other side... Supposedly, the man who should stand and fight is Saul. Now, brother Saul was the king, and he was big also and strong and huge, but he was terrified. You read the scripture, and all the kind of the, the people of God were just terrified. The question to you this morning, who is your giant, and how big is your giant? 
Now, your giants uh, uh, come to you not as people, but the giants come to us besides your boss or whoever is kind of a, uh, a per, might be a person who's bullying you. But, but, but there, there could, be, uh, could be some challenges in your life, something challenging your life, your future, your feeling of failure. The feeling of the fear in your life, your anxieties, your uh, depression, uh, your phobias could be a giant. It could be your bills. It could be your grades. It could be what's going to happen next month. It could be your career. It could be your work. It could be a past mistake. It could be your sensual attractions. It could be lust for thoughts. It could be a certain addiction or some habit that clearly controls your life. This could be your giant this morning. And by God's grace, the Lord is speaking to you. Who is your giant? And if you would allow me, I'll come and slay your giant. You, you understand? I, I hope you're not like I'm thinking of the Thanksgiving dinner or Thanksgiving lunch. I mean, just kind of uh, pause with me for a minute here. And there are four things that really characterized the situation that really gave power to David. Ultimately, the power of David was the Lord. The battle is the Lord's, he said. But these are the four steps that I would like you to kind of to focus on. The first thing is what made David triumphant in this battle. Now, David came in. I'm talking about David, and I'm very glad little David came in because we're talking about little David. So what made David triumphant? What made David triumphant is that he focused on the God of heavens, the mighty God of heavens, who's the God of his giants, brothers and sisters. He focused on the God who rules over rules over giants. Whereas in all the discussion, if you go back and read 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, 17, chapter 17, all the others around him, including his brothers and his friends, including King Saul, were focusing on the size of the giant. You see, you know, just focus with me. When you focus on your giant, on your problem, on your challenge, on the thing that frightens you, it, it becomes so big, even bigger than what it is. But if you focus on God, who is greater than all your challenges, you can overcome them. And when you kind of go to slay your giant in the name of the Lord, you overcome these giants no matter how big they are. Brothers and sisters, listen. When you focus on the giant, you stumble. When you focus on the God, on God himself, mighty God himself, your, your giants tremble and tremble before the Lord. And this morning, I want you to characterize your giants and say, Lord, I want to approach them with your name and have power of them, over them and have dominion over them, no matter what they are. And this kind of focus made a big difference with David. This is why he won the battle. You see, the battle was not between David and Goliath. The battle was between focusing on God versus focusing on the giant. And focusing on the living God made David win the battle. Now, I tell you, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, giants that are within us. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Fear, for example. Look at fear. It is said that in Vietnam, in the last part of the Vietnam War in the 60s, and I don't want to overload you with stories, but there's so many stories that you can get it from history. That last part of Vietnam, after the uh, uh, the attack on the on New Year's Eve uh, in 60, uh, 68, uh, there was tremendous fear from the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were like ISIS now. I mean, they would just appear from nowhere and just attack the army. And there was a brigade of 500. Uh, soldiers, U.S. soldiers, going through a jungle someplace, and they were expecting, it was the night, they're just moving in the night, and they were expecting an attack, that they would just jump in from someplace. And all of a sudden, one person starts shooting, basically. He feels that there is something going on, that there may be one of the Viet Cong or the Viet Cong are attacking, and everybody starts shooting. The next day, 
The next day, after almost 126 people are either injured or dead, they discover from this kind of brigade, they discovered that there was no enemy. The enemy was fear. And they were shooting at each other. One person started shooting, and everybody started shooting, and they shot each other. It's what we call friendly fire. Now, this is what happens when, when you are mesmerized by fear. is one of the giants that takes you over. In the kind of a, a recent war with the, with the ISIS group, right, right you know, a few months ago, in the June, June 10, 2014, it says that there were the, the uh, Iraqi army, the regular Iraqi army, was almost one million strong. In Mosul, which is the second, th second biggest city in Iraq, they had 350,000 soldiers. They were attacked and taken over by around five to 7,000 ISIS or ISIL group. 7,000 took over 350. How did they do that? Well, they got their cell phones. Each one of those had cell phones. They were figured it out from inside their cell phones. They texted everybody pictures of them slaying a group of soldiers someplace and um, texting from inside saying, flee because the ISIL is taking over, took over already the city. So they panicked. They believed the enemy, and they just panicked, and everybody was rushing out. ISIL took over, and they thought they're coming to them with hundreds of thousands of, of ISIL forces. They took over Mosul and took over one-third of Iraq. Look, the enemy does this thing to you. He's like a roaring lion. He would sort of hit you with lies. He would intimidate you. He would bill you. And he will create these giants and will attack you through these giants of fear and depression. And sometimes with lust and sometimes with kind of a moral attacks. And he will bring you down. And if you focus on God and the power of God that is in you. I love that verse. What then shall we say? to these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Who can bully you? Could the spiritual enemy, could the enemy bully you? Could he attack you? No. Do not allow him to plant the seeds of these kind of doubts in your mind. Who can kind of make you a failure? No, you're, you're successful in Christ. You're a winner in Christ because of the promises that you have. Talking about bullying, I remember when Teddy was around maybe four or five, I don't know if he remembers that story, but we were living on Del Rey, and all of a sudden he wanted to play with some neighbors of his age. There was nobody of his age, and there was somebody by the name of Jimmy, a neighbor who was a real bully. I mean, the guy was twice as big as he is. Teddy was four or five. The other guy was like nine. Teddy was no resemblance to current Teddy. He like, wasn't as muscular as he is. And that guy used to play with him and used to bully him and beat him up. Later on, I discovered that. So sometimes when Jimmy would come home, all of a sudden I, felt, I find like Teddy running like, like crazy. He's running like at a speed of 100 miles per hour. And all of a sudden he jumps in my lap. I'm sitting like in the living room and I'm starting to work on some of my papers and reading some sort of articles for the next journal club I have. And all of a sudden Teddy jumps in and sits in my lap. And the minute... Teddy lands in my lap. This other guy, Jimmy, is like all of a sudden becomes like an angel. He smiles and kind of like a good boy. Then I discovered the trick that the guy is kind of beating on my son. So every time like Teddy will jump into my lap, I look at him and frown and say, Jimmy, I kind of <laughs> scream at him. And now the bully is terrified because dad is there. You see what I'm saying? You have your heavenly father, you have the Lord can refer to him as the kind of commander-in-chief. He's the powerful Lord, the Lord of hosts. Rabbi Junud, you know, in Arabic it says the commander-in-chief, the head of the army. And he's on your side. And look what these people, it says, when Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid, but looked like the reaction of David. 1 Samuel 17, 26, he says, For who is this uncircumcised? In other words, he's uncircumcised. He doesn't know the Lord. Who is this uncircumcised that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
Now look, I mean, there's a big challenge before you, and I want to make it make sure it's a spiritual challenge. You're a small group of people. I tell you, you know, who are you? What kind of change can you make in Houston? And you're talking about Middle East and the world and the community around you and the people around you. Who are you? What are your resources? No, you are the children of the living God. You can make a difference in your personal life and in this kind of ministry. And this is, you know, and, and once you decide to start slaying these giants, one after the other, looking unto Jesus, focusing unto Jesus, says Hebrews 12, 2, 3, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, he's right there at the throne of God. And he can put you right there and see things from a different perspective. When you're really from, really kind of elevated, lifted up to the heavenlies, you start seeing things from the perspective of the Lord himself. The second thing is learn from previous lessons. I love that statement. Now, now listen with me here. I, I, I know kind of, this is kind of, uh, might be quite complicated, but listen. 1736, chapter 17, verse 36 and 37, it says, Your servant, that is David speaking about himself, talking to Saul, has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. Do you understand what he's saying? He said, look, I have, I have previous track record of how the Lord kind of worked in my life. And this is why it's important to start slaying the giants because, and write down these answers to prayers that you have. Pray for things that are impossible. Go beyond the expected. And I used to write them like when I'm early in my Christian life, write them in my daily kind of diary and put them one after the other and sort of build on them. And, and when a big challenge comes in, he says, the Lord would remind me, he said, Isam, do you remember what happened? When you were a pre-med student, when you prayed and something miraculous happening, I can do even more. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. So he's saying, look, I fought the bear, the big bear. It's not a baler bear. It's even bigger than the baler bear. I fought the kind of a, I fought the lion. And I can fight this man. He's not bigger than the bear. Man. But in his secret, there were secret victories in his own personal life. And it could be. Now, just kind of, let's, let's spiritually think about it. That the bear, you know, what, what would the bear kind of be an illustration of or an example of? The bear could be, you know, bear is slow and is always sleepy and so on. Could be the laziness in your life, the spiritual laziness in your life that you should overcome before you start slaying the giants. You're so lazy spiritually. You have, you, you're on the somnolent side, you know, somnolent, sleepy side. You, you have no time to read the word. You have to, no time to kind of listen. You have no time to be active spiritually. And you're like the bear. You have to slay the bear first before you slay the giant. It could be reluctance, the double-mindedness. This kind of spirit of laziness and slowness that is in your life. And this is why you're not able to find the giant and the giants in your life. Now, what is the lion? You know, the lion is aggressive, angry. And maybe there is an aggressiveness part or, a, or an anger in your life. Or there may be the pride. The lion thinks that he is the king of all the kind of forest. Maybe there is that pride that you're kind of a, and you have so much trust in yourself rather than the Lord. Maybe it's as, you know, the lion is always after flesh. He doesn't eat fruit. But he's always after flesh. And maybe there is a lust for the flesh. A secret th sin that's sort of making you weak. And you have to slay that enemy. Before you start hitting your giants. In the power of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Be sober and be vigilant. For because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
and Peter, 1 Peter 1, 7, then the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. So the Lord wants to test you by fire through various kind of incidents so that you will come out like gold and you're able then to fight the good fight of faith. You remember when as medical students in Lebanon and during the first years of residency, and we used to complain because of the, in the midst of the war, we were on call all the time. There was nothing called 70 hours per week. We were like, you know, treated we were all the time and there's so many patients to see and so many injured people. But these were good refining times because we learned the lesson of to being always serving as if we were working in the emergency room. We were tough. We were kind of tested by fire. And the people who were there were all successful. I remember all my classmates, they're in in big positions because they learned how to be tough, but especially those who are Christ-centered. We learned also under this situation that you, not to be ashamed of the gospel, even though we were intimidated and threatened and many times we're ready to be beaten, beaten or killed by people who hate the name of Christ. So when you come here, it's a piece of cake. They're going to mock you. (laughs) We've been through harder than this. So the Lord is now testing you with fire so that you'll become like gold, shining gold, and make use that you do not waste these times of difficulties in your life. Learn from your previous lessons, spiritual lessons. Number three, ignore the voice that threatens I mean, you did a great job here. I wish you had made, put more color into this. Ignore the voice that threatens. Ignore, ignore the voice that threatens. Can you imagine how this guy, his, this, this, this man, this kind of giant, was threatening him and say, I'll eat you up. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And then he tells him, he come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Look what kind of words he's speaking to him. He's sort of telling him, I'll kill you up, I'll eat you up, I'll beat you up. And this is what your enemy does, roaring like a lion. So he'll put thoughts in your mind, the enemy, the devil, that you're a failure, you are weak, you're nothing. You can't do it. And then he will bring people around you, he'll keep telling you, no, you can't do it. No, 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 no. You just can't do it. And, you know, but the Lord is saying, yes, you can, through me. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. Oh, don't listen to the enemy. Don't listen to the enemy. First part of the uh, attack on, on Russia, when Hitler and the Nazis attacked Russia, the first five months from June 22nd when the attacks start, Barbarossa, they called it, Operation Barbarossa. It started June 22nd, 1941. And when they moved in by early October, now we're talking almost five or four and a half months, they have conquered basically half of Russia and took over three million prisoners and maybe more than a million are killed or or injured of the Russian soldiers. The army collapsed. And they were at the gates of Moscow. And they were coming into Stalingrad. Now, one of the best generals was the general uh, of the Russian army, Zhukov. He made sure that now will not allow them to listen anymore to the radio station of the enemy. He said, look, they're human like us. They have flesh and blood. We're even stronger than them. We can withstand the bad weather much better than them. Don't listen to the voice of the enemy. And he made sure he did all of these things electronic so that he will paralyze them, not be able, anybody from the soldiers or the people would hear the voice of the enemy. Do not Listen to the voice of the enemy, the voice that threatens, the voice that puts you down. The brothers of David told him, oh, you're nothing. Who are you? I mean, Saul looked at him and said, put this armor. Maybe that helps you. He told him, no, no, this armor is too big for me. I cannot use it. I haven't tested it. He told him, come on, brother. Uh, go. I'll pray for you. Look at Saul told him. Many times they can say, all right, you just go do it. I will pray for you. If it's God's will, you'll survive. You'll be beaten, but you'll, be, you'll survive with so many injuries. No, brother, he went in and said, Oh, the Lord of God made you mine. 
And this is what the Lord is speaking to you today. Who walks in, who walks not in the counsel? This is blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor he sits in the seat of the scornful, the mockers. Do not sit with the mockers who mock Christ, or do not sit with carnal Christians who sit now next to you and they keep kind of putting you down. But listen to the voice of the Lord and the word of the Lord. It is said that in, the, in some of these mountains next to the Himalayas, they made this kind of a the race, or if you may, that who would be able to kind of climb that steepy part of the Himalaya mountain? And they had some very good mountain climbers. But one guy, you know, their families were watching, and it's so steepy, and they would go up, and there is a place where they would fall down, and there's, their families would start screaming, oh, no, John, please come back, forget about it. But there was one guy, no matter how many times he would sort of go down, he keeps climbing up. And he got upstairs, and he got finally won the kind of gold medal. They told him, what's your secret? He said, look, I put some music in my ears. And we said, what it is? We shall overcome. I know deep in my heart that we shall overcome someday. Listen to the heavenly music, to the heavenly voice. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Somebody is waving for me now to finish because I exceeded my time. But number four, I think this is very important. Rely on spiritual, not carnal weapons. They gave him, you know, Saul, bless his heart. It's not Saul of the New Testament. It's Saul of the Old Testament. He's terrible. He gave him his sword and he gave him his armor. He said, I can't use that. He said, what are you going to use? He said, my stones Stones, and it'll have a little stick, and have my five stones. And you know what stones stand for? That stone that he hit him from the first time, it stands for Christ. He's the rock of ages. It refers to him in First Peter. It says to coming, coming to him, to Christ, as the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. He's the precious stone. And this represents Christ. And his people, that's why he had five stones. Why did he have five stones? Samuel Ahud used to always remind me. He used to say, why did I, you know, one time he sort of told me, why did he have five stones? I didn't know the answer. He had one stone to kind of beat that giant, but he had four others in case any of his four brothers would move. And he knew that he'll beat every one of them. I love that spirit. Brother, come on, give me a sword of the spirit. Let's fight. Now we want to become an army, can't, can't we? Don't we? Let's become the Lord's army. Be enlisted this morning to start a big fight. And the Lord was with him. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds. Are there strongholds in your life? That sort of keep you from achieving what the Lord wants you to achieve? Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. To start a new beginning today. Today is the day of the Lord. Declare that kind of uprising and revolution. Today, I'm going to get all the weapons of the Lord. I'm going to walk and become part of the Lord's army. I'm going to start slaying these giants one by one. And I'm going to depend on the promise of the living God. Because the battle is the Lord's, not mine. I remember at the end of the Civil War in Lebanon, things were so messy. I went to visit, and we had to travel from Beirut to Damascus. Now, most of the road between Beirut and Damascus were basically shut down. You can't travel. But my cousin told me, don't worry, there is another road, which we call it the military road. And he said, but this one, only kind of military people go. He said, don't worry, I'll take you. That one is open. You drive at 60 miles per hour. There is no problem whatsoever. And my cousin, the dentist, Dr. Rafat, 
took me up and you know we were going like in that nice road and all of a sudden we see roadblock with, with soldiers in it and angry soldiers you know it's at the end of the civil war they just took over that area and they put their machine guns at us stop and my cousin like you know he stops there still Rafat I told you why did you bring us here <clears throat> I said don't worry takes out the letter and he shows them the letter and when they see the letter they read it like this they salute us. Fadal, welcome. The same thing happens the second time. They told him, give me that letter. What is in that letter? Now, that letter is from the commander in chief of the Lebanese army, who was appointed then. It happened that he was a student of my father when he taught in college. And he writes in that Dr. Rafat Rad and Dr. Isam Rad will be going up. Please let them go in. They're my special people. See what it is? The difference that that letter made, we didn't have machine guns, we didn't have cannons. We had a promise from the commander in chief. And you have a promise from the commander in chief. The gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You can do all things in Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Now take it, capture it in your heart, hide it in your heart. And say, Lord, I'm going to claim that promise. I want to dedicate my life to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you heard our cries this morning and you heard the cries of our hearts. We want to belong to you. We want to be part of your army. We are your children. And we want to fight your fight. Oh, Father, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, slay the giant. And before that, slay the bear of somnolence and laziness and spiritual inactivity. Slay that bear in our lives. Slay the lion of anger and pride and self-sufficiency and self-centeredness. The lion of lust for the flesh. And Lord, reign in our hearts, purify our hearts and move through us. Because if you are with us, who can be against us? And how come the gates of hell can stand against us? Oh Lord, we become, we want to become fully yours. And whatever giants would hinder us from climbing and conquering that mountain, you slain them this morning. Lord, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the next few seconds that we would identify this one giant and this second giant, Lord, and this third giant, Lord, that's standing before us, and this fourth one and the fifth one. Lord, we put them before you and you slay them one and after the other. And maybe there is another ten giants, Lord, we want to just have you kind of move and sort of slay them right now. And we want to move forward like a mighty army who belong to a mighty Lord, who is you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue worshiping the Lord today with our offerings, and let us uh, continue praising him with the song 10,000 Reasons.